Offside Broadcast, the best Vox casting either side of the breach. Bearing the Burden October 12 Have you figured out how they are animated? Nicodem asked, leaning close to the abomination on the table. I haven't a clue, Dr. McMorning admitted, his gloved hands held loosely behind his back. They twisted and fidgeted anxiously. Nicodem poked the flesh of the cadaver, cut in a square from the muscle beneath, one side still connected to the body. It was pinned to the wooden slab at the two corners of the skin. It was thin and dry like paper. Nicodem felt the firm flesh, hard and brittle, with his forefinger. McMorning didn't approve. The undertaker traced the tube protruding from its wrist that travelled within his forearm to exit at its armpit and into its open chest cavity. The tubing connected to a metal tank approximately four inches in diameter. And although embedded within the thing's chest, there were numerous dials, gauges, and adjustable knobs to the adjoining apparatus. With the inner organs removed and the front of its chest fully absent, perhaps the original reanimator, clearly a prodigy of resurrection and grafting, could continue to make modification on the design and operation. How did our anonymous friend reanimate a corpse so old? So disconnected from its spirit and forgotten in the depths of time, he asked softly, more to himself than McMorning. Still, McMorning responded, That's exactly why I called you here. The grafting technology makes no sense. Like it's superfluous, an afterthought, half of the internal apparatus, and even connected. Nicodem was sceptical. This chamber he said, pointing to the internal cylinder. It's the necrotic pump, no? McMorning grinned a broad and toothy smile. It made Nicodem scowl in contrast. Yes. They keep thinking it's a steam boiler. Nicodem opened a small hatch at the top of the rusted cylinder, and the stale and acrid odour of necrotic residue struck him at once. It was long dry, of course but the smell would linger forever. Steam? 
Why would they think so? Narrow-minded, of course. They get fixated on one idea and cannot accept any other. Then what do you make of the pomp and necrotic assemblies if they're superfluous? My theory is that this corpse has been reanimated several times. Nicodem lifted his head from examining the disconnected apparatus within the remains. I cannot tell which might have come first. A reanimation using more conventional resurrectionist arts such as you employ, or the grafted mechanica that may have first driven it. And now they've been awakened again? By the event? He shrugged. Possibly. But many modifications to this corpse have been made over the numerous years since its original demise. Although dead flesh does not scar, of course, lacerations into it decompose differently to surrounding tissue. Some of these inner components have been added to the original design and older materials discarded, but left mounted where it was. What's most fascinating is not how it's been reanimated. Of course it is, Nicodem interrupted. Raising a single corpse over and over despite injuries to the flesh. This could be the missing piece to our puzzle. Yes, we will study this thing, of course. But listen, this corpse is ancient. Endeavorborn, some ancient practitioner ahead of his time. Much of the technology is too modern. And the corpse isn't exactly Neverborn. Then human, from the first breach exploration a hundred years ago. McMorning smiled that broad, ridiculous smile that made him look like a carved jack-o'-lantern. He cracked his knuckles and looked practically overjoyed. It's not human either. It's far older than the other breach as well. This has anatomy similar to both humanoid species, like it's descended from both, many generations removed from the originals. Nicodem's scowl drew deeper. We know that small breaches open from here to there all the time. They must have brought some humans over and conducted some experiments, Nicodem offered. Even he was not convinced. McMorning's expressive face conveyed his distaste of the theory. Not like the Neverborn we know. They would crossbreed with a human? That seems the kind of thing only a human would do. His grin returned to the discomfort of Nicodem. Seems the kind of thing I would do. He began wringing his hands, excited at the prospect. His mind was already busy thinking of the difficulties in the endeavour, the delicious impossibility and the joy of overcoming it. He detached further and further from Nicodem, into his own realm of science and the twisting of the natural law that was his dominion. His pondering was interrupted as the bulbous head of McMorning's assistant, Sebastian, popped from around the heavy wood door to the dissection lab. Pardon and excuse me, sir, he said, his thick tongue smacking within his mouth and his fleshy jowls quivering. But there be a inspector or two waiting to ask a few questions of you, sir. One of Sebastian's eyes pointed to the ceiling above the two resurrectionists, while his primary eye may have fallen in the general direction of either McMorning or Nicodem. And I may be so bold, doctor, and his voice dropped to a hoarse whisper. But I believe they got a death marshal along. Sebastian sounded like a buffoon, just a simpleton off of old London's impoverished streets. He was far from any of those things Nicodem knew. It was all an act, obfuscating the truth of a man who knew and understood far more than any might suspect. McMorning didn't seem to notice Sebastian or acknowledge his statement. So it was Nicodem who said, Stall them, Mr. Sebastian. Give them a tour of the good doctor's examining room. That should give them something to be excited about. Both men smiled at one another. Sebastian, because it added to the illusion of his simplicity. Nicodem merely to add to the illusion of his genteel politeness. Both knew the guild inspectors would find nothing incriminating in this mortuary. Not that McMorning was overly cautious. On the contrary. He was addled and absolutely forgot he even stood upon guild facilities. Sebastian, however, he had everything for his master. Now, of course, sir, uh, I believe twill. He waddled off to keep the guild inquisitors running in circles. 
Doctor, Nickdam ordered, his voice more commanding than his thin frame would suggest. McMorning's eyes fell upon him. Guild inspectors? Death marshals? Yes, and it's their third visit, so I imagine it'll be an uncomfortable afternoon. Nickadam sighed, but managed to refrain from rolling his eyes. What have you done to garner their attention? What you requested, actually. Trying to make a better warrior. And I stole a page from your book. Like you used those crazy sword-wielding Nipponese monstrosities. I've been working with some deceased guild guardsmen. That's why the inspectors are here. A couple of guild autopsies seem to be missing, he said in a mocking wilt. So did you succeed? Can they shoot? They can, but not worth a damn. I'm still fiddling with their brains to see if I can access that part of their training and get them to remember. So far, if you give them the typical weapons they were trained to use in life, they seem to try and shoot the sword and slice with the gun. Doesn't matter if you switch the weapons to the other hand. He drifted off in thought again, forgetting the gravity of the inspectors waiting to question him. He was thinking of the brain and the layout of the organ, already contemplating how he might revise his last attempts. Neither felt any urgency to either finish their discussion or evade the guild inspectors. Nicodem gave no thought to the guild officers within the building when he said, We cannot afford to wait much longer. What of the reclusive scientist you once spoke of? Could he give you any insight into this problem? Identify something you are overlooking. It's been long enough, and neither of us have made any significant progress. McMorning winced. It clearly offended him to suggest he could not solve this problem. He's no longer a teacher. No longer my professor, that's for sure. No. You said he came to Malifaux to escape the law that condemned his experimenting on the deceased. Is he still here, conducting those experiments? I don't have a bloody clue. It's been over a year since we spoke. I hear he's not been in the city in nearly as long. Maybe he's got himself killed out there in the wild, poking his nose in a Nephilim nest. McMorning hated to admit that anyone was a better scientist, but his old teacher was something of a prodigy, and pioneered an entirely new way of looking at the function of the anatomical form. In fact, he might have inadvertently invented the resurrectionist art, though that was not exactly his intention. He would say that he wanted to improve upon what nature had begun. It was, however, enough to have him driven out of the university at Ingolstadt, where McMorning had enthusiastically studied beneath him, his research compound in the Orkney Islands, and finally from his lab in North Africa, where he was rumoured to have conducted horrifying experiments that were intolerable to civilised man. In fact, his experiments were deemed as crimes against humanity, though McMorning considered them nothing short of revolutionary and inspirational. Dr. McMorning, in fact, pursued the work of his old professor so doggedly that a report from Scotland Yard, though vague and clearly misrepresentative of the facts, so inspired McMorning that he too fled the old world to take up residence in Malifaux. Now, like the professor that gave birth to a science of longevity and staving off death itself, the law had come knocking upon his door. The narrow minds of the simple man sought to judge what it could not possibly comprehend, he thought. Doctor, Nicodem barked, shaking McMorning from his reverie. Those times were long gone, and the old professor surely devoured alone in Malifaux's wilds. Stay focused. Nicodem said, clearly annoyed. McMorning understood. He had little use for the living. They were all a mere irritation to him. Ironic, since his own research was focused on bringing an eternal life from the ashes of death, to give back what must be taken from all living things. The thought reminded him of the key piece to the unsolvable puzzle. What if you're a new prodigy? What's her name? Karai. Hmm, whatever. Have you implanted a spirit into one of our empty vessels? No. Nicodem cursed beneath his breath, irritated at the string of setbacks that kept them from initiating plans that should have already ensured their freedom from the vigilant probing of the guild 
and any other eyes that sought to keep them from their destiny. Keep working on the guild autopsies, then. We need something that can properly challenge those who oppose us. Give me that, and you will have the place to conduct the research you wished unimpeded. Now what of this problem with the inspectors? McMorning waved his hand as if brushing aside a fly. I'll kill them. Dress them up like the autopsies that went missing. Two birds, one stone, that sort of thing. Nicodem couldn't help but roll his eyes that time. There will be a paper trail. More inquiries about why these guild officials went missing. Ah, yes, you're right. What a nuisance they are. You will no doubt use them to conduct the next wave of experiments. Will you not stop until Lady Justice herself comes to ask you some questions? McMorning looked surprised, assessing whether Nicodem was serious or joking. Then he remembered who he was addressing. Justice? Have you not heard? What? A lady is in the infirmary across the street. Nicodem nearly staggered. Eyes wide, he asked. Here. She's wounded. McMorning rolled his eyes then, mocking Nicodem. I'd say. She's only regained consciousness once since your observatory fell on her. You nearly killed her. Really? That was months ago. She's still comatose. I assumed she escaped unscathed. I thought she was indestructible. And I nearly killed her. Nearly. Don't get too proud of yourself. You blew her up, and your whole complex fell on her, and she still breathes. But yes, she suffers. One side of her body is crushed, and she struggles even to breathe. Which side? It matters. She swings the sword with the right. McMorning nodded. That's the crushed side. Nicodem nodded, pleased by the discussion with McMorning after all. Well then, I'll depart. Out the back way, of course. You have visitors. And I wouldn't like to keep them waiting any longer. In fact, he heard the clack of their boots upon the wood beyond the chamber door, and Sebastian's voice echoing down the hall, ensuring McMorning wouldn't be taken by surprise. Nicodem tipped his hat to McMorning as he slipped through the narrow secret door, hidden behind a shelf of books, beakers, and other lab equipment. As he pulled the shelf closed behind him, the main door to the chamber opened, and McMorning stood stoically beside the partially dissected remains of the abomination, hauled back into his lab from the open pit with the bayou. The two inspectors brushed past Sebastian in a half, but he merely smiled and nodded at each as they passed. The death marshal, wide-brimmed hat pulled low over his brow, leaned a shoulder against the opposite doorframe, too close to Sebastian for comfort. The assistant seemed not to care, and smiled absently at him too, licking his lips audibly, nodding happily at the officer. The death marshal turned to regard him, the upper portion of his face obscured in shadow. The lower part, however, caught the light briefly as he slowly returned the nod to Sebastian, and it was oddly discoloured and grey, with thin tendrils of flesh pulled taut from cheekbone to jaw and exposed musculature beneath as if part of the skin had rotted away. At first the assistant suspected leprosy, but realized this death marshal was not fresh off the guardsman line, rather a seasoned veteran of the position that had come into contact with too much necrotic fluid, charged with the acidic chemicals and magics that allowed a resurrectionist to infuse a corpse with more than mere mindless shambling, but with a brief inclination of emotion that Nicodem demanded. Bringing a death marshal was warning enough, but this one might be one of the highest of their ranks. Perhaps had been elevated to the command of the department while justice and judge recovered. Dr. McMorney, one inspector began. The lead you've given us turned out to be dead ends, I'm afraid. McMorney stood emotionlessly beside the corpse on the gurney, eyes fixed upon him. Questions keep us coming back to you, it seems. Oh yes, you've been very helpful in leading us to new suspects. They have a tendency to give us one dead end after another. Any idea why that might be? McMorning raised his eyebrows and cocked his head to the side. The beginning of that mischievous grin tugged at the corner of his lips. 
dead end, you say? Dead end. I find that interesting. He reached out and lifted the scalpel from beside the partial head of the corpse. Casually, without hurry, he stepped forward toward the inspector. It was likely because of the casual manner in which he moved that none of the men reacted at all. He showed no sign of aggression or of fear. He simply held the instrument of his office, and even the death marshal, eyes upon McMorning throughout and trained to suppress any danger before it might get out of control, failed to react, leaning still against the doorframe opposite Sebastian. As McMorning reached the inspector, his arm slashed from its position at his side up to the inspector's neck, the long but narrow blade slicing easily through his throat, so deeply that the blade struck the spine at the back. A thick stream of blood sprayed to his left from the severed jugular, but the motion of the blade up and through the left sent a trail into the face of the second inspector, causing him to jump and shriek. At the sight of the blood, McMorning became a blur, dropping his arm quickly. The scalpel flew through the room, striking the death marshal in the shoulder as he too came alive. He had begun pulling the gun from his holster, but McMorning's scalpel severed enough of the nerves that his entire arm fell limply at his side. He was no coward, but no fool either. And with the experience of the office behind him, he knew exactly what he faced in that dissection lab. He jerked back to flee and gather the reinforcements necessary to bring this villain to proper justice. But as he moved through the entry, Sebastian reached out and grabbed the scalpel still protruding from the officer's shoulder and pulled him to a halt as if it were a leash. The marshal howled in unexpected pain as the narrow blade twisted deep within his flesh. His other arm came up to bat the fleshy man away, but much faster than he could have predicted. Sebastian had the scalpel out of his shoulder and sliced cleanly through the officer's throat. Like the inspector, his head lolled back, away from the deep cut. And he fell lifelessly, his hat at the feet of Sebastian, still smiling vacantly as if nothing were at all amiss. The second inspector trembled between the two corpses, bleeding out on the floor, the dark pool enveloping his feet from either side. He bore a firearm, but was too shocked to remember it. Instead, standing in place, eyes wide and lower lip trembling, McMorning stepped over the body at his feet, his boots slurping at the sticky blood around it. He put his open palm against the man's face, above the nose, and fingers stretched out across the breadth of his head. He pressed the man back against the wall and down into a crouch. The inspector gibbered incoherently, and tears came to his eyes. Not exactly the image of the pinnacle of manly bravado the Guild liked to project of its law enforcement. McMorning's grin was broad, and his eyes sinister, as he spoke down to the man below him, now powerless and stammering for mercy, knowing he would soon be dead. Let me see, McMorning said. Those missing autopsies that caused all this fuss. You remember them, Inspector? Y yes, he stammered. One was killed by a sword through the jugular. Say just like your friend here. I remember that. But the other guardsman, how did he die again? The man's eyes darted back and forth in confusion and mounting panic. <laughs> bludgeoning to the head. But please don't do this. I, We can work out a deal. Yes, that's right. He did not take his eyes from the inspector, but held his hand back towards Sebastian, palm open. Sebastian was already approaching him with a large wooden mallet. It didn't seem possible, but McMorning's smile widened, now bright and toothy as he took the mallet from his assistant. The smile spanned his entire face. Bludgeoning to the head, he grunted, and the mallet came down heavily upon the inspector's head.
on the edge of your seat stuff, right? Unexpected stitchcraft twisting your mortal body into your own armchair will do that to a person. Now, for a word from our sponsors. Although, this word comes grudgingly, as it is for the much maligned, soon to be dead, print press. When will these people put aside their words and realise that audio is an easier way for controlling the masses? Anyway, petty personal opinions aside, squabbling over, professional face on, professional face on, writes, ahem, newspapers, they're still live and kicking, don't you know? And, in the case of the Malifaux record, print is in a state of living afterlife and constantly spewing bile. If you get my drift, this Ethervox presenter certainly does not. Ahem. You'll certainly want to get your hands, I remember hands, on tomorrow's copy of the Malifaux Daily Record. It has all the usual features, I'm sure. Being stuck in a sack doesn't give you much of a chance to read the rag sheets. But more importantly than that, it has an exclusive article by Molly Squid Pitch, deceased, who is lovely and great and will hopefully buy me a new bag after hearing this. Our candid reporter blows the lid off the McTeague Octavius Hall scandal, only in the... Hmm. It cuts off there. The rest of the paper bitten off. The writing on the whole is shabby. It doesn't do much to uplift the view of the press in my mind. We're natural foes, you see. When we see each other, we freeze like lizards, just standing around, opened eyes for hours, waiting for danger to pass. Next story. Right, time to come clean. Another casualty of our New Year's revelry. We had it all ready to go, but it was either the drinking games, you know, the one where you look up at the ceiling, roll your eyes into the back of your head, and croak. Or the weird bearded fellow wandering around the office that kind of cause an accident. The story got torn up into little bits. What we bring to you now is the remains of that epic. Enjoy. The Guild. Hoffman. Avatar of Amalgamation Malifaux Station Four months after the event The Pellucidar burst from the ground like a nail punching through rotten wood. Boulders the size of wagons flew through the air, ripped from beneath the earth by the mighty drilling machine as it surged clear. Its huge serpentine body reared up, then collapsed onto the railroad tracks leading into Malifaux Station. The impact was so fierce the tracks rippled like water. On platform two, men and women were standing in open-mouthed shock. None of them noticed Hoffman's arrival, or the uniformed men at his heels. You forced it to the surface, Mr. Hoffman, sir, wheezed the out-of-breath guild guard sergeant. I take it we just, uh, turn it off now, yes? Let the union sort it out. Ah, uh, no, remarked Hoffman. I may have lied to you very slightly about that bit. Sorry, Sergeant, but this one's gone rogue. It won't just let us turn it off. More importantly, it is coming this way. The drilling machine's side propellers had dug into the ground, ripping huge sections of rail apart and driving it forward. The drilling cone on the front spun with a deafening shriek. The crowds on the platform screamed and ran as the Pellucidar roared past. Chunks of masonry and slabs of paving scattered in its wake. Hoffman dived for cover, debris raining all around him, and once again, he felt it. The metal, the machinery all around him, embedded underground, wrought within the buildings, the iron supports for the roof, the station boiler, the great rail engines in their cars, he was not just aware of them. They were aware of him. Not just aware. They wanted something. They wanted to. His harness was buckled from the impact of the Pellucidar, barely halted by the mass of metal in front of him. He felt the harness move, gathering splinters of iron from the railings and brass from the carriage lamps. It knitted together and he rose, and the mass of metal rose with him. 
With an ear-splitting shriek, cold steel burst loose from the brickwork it encased and lead ripped free from the roof of the station. Hoffman focused the energies of the event, feeling the metalwork and the machinery responding to him eagerly. The raw metal formed itself around him, cradling him, snapping together into titanic legs and bending into a torso, integrating with his harness as he rose higher and higher. He let the metal call to him, pulling his awareness, his soul, he surmised, out of his body and into the metallic behemoth forming around him. His body collapsed as the last bit of his essence spilled into it, caught by one enormous arm and cradled like an infant to its body. They wanted to protect him. The Pellucidar coiled back on itself for another pass. Hoffman strode toward it, every step bringing more metal ripping from the buildings and structures around him. As he approached the stationary engines in the classification yard, they broke apart to join him, wheels and couplers bulking out his shoulders, valve gear and pistons strengthening constructed arms. Sheet steel layered together around an iron track handle, and suddenly he held a sword ten feet long and a burning desire to wield it in anger. The Pellucidar recoiled its soulstone-powered mind wary of this new threat. Hoffman flung his arms wide, and all the steel in the station issued a roar of challenge. Then the drilling machine lowered its head, racing toward him on another attack run. Whatever might happen next, he knew, the metal would do what it could to protect him like a brother. He raised his sword and ran to meet the Pellucidar head on. Justice, Avatar of Balance Buck's Tale Cemetery, seven weeks after the event. She moved with a sure-footed grace through the tombstones, despite the thick blanket of darkness covering the cemetery. All but silent, she approached the soft glow ahead, her greatsword held easily in her hands. The two men worked, oblivious to her approach. The rough sound of shovels and the rougher language they used helped to mask her movements until she was no louder than a ghost among the dead. She froze when the shovels stopped, wondering for a fleeting moment if they'd felt her presence. Then one spoke. "'This here's the one, Bob,' he crowed. The other voice, Bob, she assumed, shushed the first. "'Yes, Pinkle, you want to wake the dead? Of course this is the one.' It's the name that old codger wrote down for us. You know I don't have the letters, Bob, Pinkle mumbled. Sorry, lad, you're right. Look, this is the right one. She heard the thunk of a shovel hitting wood. Give me a hand. She could hear a bit more scraping and the sound of the two men muscling something heavy out of the ground. She used the noise as cover to get close to them. She ducked down as she heard them climb out of the grave putting her back against the cool slab of a tombstone. More grunting and noise. She was sure they were employing pry bars to open up the coffin. Here it is. Told you. She could hear more scuffling as the two men helped themselves to the jewelry she knew was on the body. She decided it was time, and stepped out into their feeble lantern light. Enough. The voices she had suppressed after the events at the observatory came to her in a whispering rush. They spoke in absolute truths, how every action fostered a mirrored action, how the universe craved a balance, seeking to compensate action with reaction. They shared with her how to unlock that balance, how to become its agent. She could see, briefly, two winged creatures, one with the head of a raven, the other a ram's head. They appeared to be locked in a cosmic struggle, each gaining an advantage over the other only briefly. Hands where I can see them, she ordered, as the image faded from her mind. Pinkle's arms thrust up from within the coffin, hands filled with gold. Bob's remained below the lid. She leveled the great sword's blade at Bob. Now. He raised his arms, swinging the shovel he had held onto at her head. After all, she was blind, the stories went. She ducked his swing, the magic filling her as she moved. She repositioned herself, using her blade to guide Bob to the edge of the grave and held him there, the sword's tip poking him in the chest. Oh, 
how did you find us?" Pinkel asked, paralyzed with fear. Lady Justice turned her bandaged eyes on him, summoning crackling bands of ether to bind his arms and feet. He yelped and dropped the jewelry at their touch. "The codger told me before he died. You sicken me. He was a defenceless old man." Bob shrugged. "He buried it with her. Better in our pockets than stuck in the ground." She leaned in close to him, her gaze pinning him through the blindfold. "You take, you never give, Bob. I can see it in your heart. There is no peace within you. No balance. But you can help me. You can give me something. You can give me your life." Bob glanced back, feet slipping over the edge of the grave. He snapped his arm forward, and a derringer he kept hidden slid into his hand propelled by a mechanism strapped to his forearm. The pistol fired as he felt pain explode in his chest. He tumbled back into the grave, the final darkness reaching out for him. Lady Justice touched the line of blood where the bullet had grazed her cheek. Now you and the codger are even, she said to the dark hole as she dragged Pinkle to his feet and led him off into the night. Perdita, Avatar of Revelation High above the Badlands, five months after the event. There, she thought to the creature beneath her, near the dry wash. The creature's bat-like wings adjusted. They turned toward the tan ribbon of the dry wash, two pairs of eyes watching events unfold, both hoping they would reach the site in time. Farita could make out the shape of the overturned wagon. Two wheels aimed at the sky, while several large dark shapes flew above the wreckage, occasionally diving toward the smaller dark shapes clustered near the wagon. That's quite a few of them, and we are alone. A wave of reassuring emotion was the creature's only response. Alone. She was often alone now. Ever since the event, she'd kept mainly to herself. She disliked what she saw all too often in others. Things she would never have registered before the purple wave changed her. She found it difficult to sense Santiago's beast-like aggression, Francisco's jealousy, and even young Nino's uncertainty. And then there was Papa. It broke her heart to see the sane man trapped behind insanity's walls. Whenever her familiar put their hands out in support and concern, she turned her back on them preferring the solitude of the Badlands and rides on the strange creature with whom she shared this unexplainable bond. She could not bring herself to name it, as if giving it a name would somehow complete whatever transformation she was going through. Instead, she would call to it, and they would fly across the Badlands, never straying near the chasm that had caused all of this. When they had first seen the wagon, she wondered what a pioneer family was doing so far from the trails. But she had put the thought aside. Pioneers were always a bit loco, striking off into the wilds like they did. Only now that she decided to check on the little wagon's progress did she realize what danger its owners had stirred up. The creature roared a challenge as they dived toward the cluster of Nephilim. Her peacebringers were already in her hands and the two shots she fired took the closest of the monsters in the head, sending a corpse tumbling to the ground. The second was torn in half by a single bite from the creature's distended jaws as they landed. She took stock of the situation quickly, surveying the options she had of surviving this. Six massive Nephilim stood between her and the pioneers. Two of the monsters ignored the small cuts and wounds dotting their bodies, while a third's arm dangled loosely at its side. Three of the five pioneers in the wagon shadow lay either dead or dying, the coppery tang of their blood fouling the otherwise dry Badlands air. The remaining two brandished their weapons, a small knife and old pistol, as if they were a relic blade and peace bringer, pleading for her help. She almost laughed at the absurdity of it all. One of the Nephilim charged her, furiously beating wings, lending it momentum. She did not have to direct the creature. It leaped from the ground, and the Nephilim passed beneath them, its claws closing on empty space. She leaned over the creature's side, and her guns barked, 
driving the Nephilim to the ground, bullets tearing through its shoulders and wings. Then it happened. The whispers filled her thoughts once again, urging her to look harder. She looked again at the Nephilim. They were filled with rage, yes, but something more. A feeling of loss and longing, a parental emptiness directed at the wagon. The pioneers, too, were filled with something. It was ugly, and stained their features with remorseless cruelty. The whispering ceased, replaced with a very real mewling coming from the overturned wagon. Sickened, she kept her pistols trained on the Nephilim. They held off their attack, sensing her confusion. The pioneers no longer pleaded for her aid. Now they begged her not to look in the wagon. As her hand reached for the rough canvas, she saw a flicker of movement and fired, shooting the old pistol out of the pioneer's hand before he shot her. She tore the canvas flap back and gasped. The tumbled stack of cages each contained a Nephilim youth, a tot the family called them. They bore evidence of malnourishment and abuse, pitiful creatures. She saw them clearly, something vaguely human in their suffering and fear. She hissed at the pioneers. Sharing a wordless exchange with the Nephilim, she urged the creature to take flight, ignoring the sounds of carnage behind her. We truly are all monsters, she mused. The creature did not reply. Sonya, Avatar of Conflagration, Redemption City, Moments Before the Event the creature was certainly not a leader among those transcendent beings, she surmised, translating quickly, instinctively. It did not lead, did not desire dominion, but it conquered. All fell to its consuming wrath. Frantically, she skimmed ahead. They rose against the serpent, seeking to quench the flames of destruction and damnation. The tyrants and lowly throng they sought dominion over put aside their conflict, to confront the one burning beast, Cherufe. Then, reading almost peripherally, her heart stopped when it read, Its return will mark the end. It will burn below the last city. It will consume those that come after us to live in the city above the necropolis from beyond. Cherufe will choose one of them to deliver it from final bondage, the final key to its bonds. She quickly flipped the page and the symbols came together as the prophesied image of the one that would again free the demonic tyrant Cherufe. The blurry, smudged, and abstract image caused her heart to stop, and a gasp choked in her throat. It was her. Cherufe will feed endlessly from her burning spirit. Sonya's eyes widened. Sir Mel Hopkins, sipping his steaming coffee from the entrance of the small library, drew her attention saying, uh, Sonia? Any idea what the hell that is? He nodded against the biting cold toward the sky that grew red, illuminating his features strangely in the dim early morning light. He thought it was nothing more than a large shooting star, but when he turned to her, she seemed crestfallen, saddened at seeing the object blazing across the sky. What is it, darling? he asked and accustomed to seeing her shaken. Moments later, he was consumed by pain and nausea, and his body crashed against the doorframe. But it was Sonya's transformation that dispelled the otherwise consuming anguish she experienced. A thick column of fire burst through the floorboards, sending long daggers of splintered wood flying and burning. The raging pillar engulfed her, and blasted through the roof above. Within the quickly churning fire, he could see her, risen from the ground and held aloft by tendrils of fire that ate through the buildings and caused him to shrink away as it singed his flesh, but brought her no harm within the growing conflagration. He scuttled away on his backside, out of the building with fire licking after him. It consumed the structure, devouring it in a raging inferno that grew far more quickly than seemed possible. Arms outstretched, Sonya rose through the growing hole in the roof, the fire dripping from her arms in sheets. She leaned forward and flew toward the buildings of the Neverborn Ruins. 
a thick cone of fire leapt from her mouth, engulfing building after building in raging flames. The pillar behind her stretched up, and Samael thought he saw a massive head form in the conflagration, watching her do its bidding, laughing on the crackling fire that hissed and devoured the buildings in a heat that dispelled the biting wind. is a narrative of sorts in that piece, a beginning, a middle, and an end, always in that order. In fact, if you cast your mind back mere moments, we have that sequence performed for you a number of times. Added value, I might add. That was the reasoning we gave to station management, and they allowed us to keep our jobs, for the time being. A few smaller points to cover before we wrap up, a pair of community notices to pay attention to. Firstly, the Witch Hunters would like to remind citizens to stay clear of any Witchling Stalkers. If they want to see you, they'll come to you. All Stalkers should be accompanied by a Handler, and if you see one who isn't, report their location to the Guild Headquarters with the utmost urgency. Rounding off the program with a... a lost property notice. I, I, I guess it mentions the terrible, utterly terrible train derailment at Creepwood Station and the human cost was not the only thing that was lost that day. It turns out a small child has lost their teddy. Ah! If you find said toy, just hand it in to the station's lost property office. It's the one next to the train wreck. Stay tuned next for the sound of a faraway train, although there is no knowing where it is going. And stay safe out there in this new year, listeners, because bad things happen. <laughs>